Thank you for joining today's webinar on insights into emergency market authorization for COVID-19 IVDs. NSF International is a global leader in public health and safety. We provide clinical trial, audit, consulting, and training services in over 180 countries. NSF is a global leader in public health and safety, and we've worked on over 100 clinical trial projects around the globe. We have steadfast ties with key associations and government agencies. We have nearly 3,000 experienced professionals on staff, and we've been in business for over 75 years. NSF provides an array of services for the health sciences industry. Today's presenters work primarily with IVDs, clinical trials, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices. Today's presentation will be led by our IVD expert, Robin Morant, and Dr. Maggie Ho, our clinical trial expert. Hello everyone, I'm Robin Murant, and today I'm going to talk to you about emergency market authorizations that occur in the US, EU, and Australia, and also discuss what the WHO is doing to assist countries without strong regulatory capacity. After that, I will be followed by my colleague, Dr. Maggie Ho, who will discuss what is happening in Asia. Good regulatory practice proposes that in certain emergency situations pertaining to medical products, short-term measures based on a country's existing legal framework should be taken in order to address the immediate necessity of protecting public health. The WHO guidance I have referenced here tells us that there are different means for this to happen. Some of this requires a change to current procedure, for example, creating an emergency use, use authorization, or it may be that you rely on the decision of other regulators. So let's turn to the US. Today I wish to initially discuss some history to emergency authorization of IVDs. Unexpectedly, it was the FDA who first initiated the EUA in 2009. In response to requests from the US CDC to make available diagnostic and therapeutic tools to identify and respond to the 2009 swine flu outbreak under certain circumstances. Section 564 of the Act permits the FDA Commissioner to authorise the use of unapproved medical product or an unapproved use of an approved medical product during a declared emergency involving a heightened risk of attack on the public or US military forces or a significant potential to affect national security. EUA candidates are those that may be effective to prevent, diagnose or treat in humans serious or life-threatening diseases or conditions and include products and uses that are not approved, cleared or licensed. So how is an emergency use authorization issued? Section 564C of the Act requires that the data to support authorization demonstrates that, based on the totality of scientific evidence available to the FDA, it is reasonable to believe that the product may be effective in diagnosing, treating, or preventing the serious or life-threatening disease or condition. The exact type and amount of data needed to support an EUA may vary depending on the nature of the declared emergency and the nature of the candidate product. To facilitate FDA review of such data, the agency recommends that a request for consideration for an EUA include a well-organized summary of the available scientific evidence that evaluates the product's safety and effectiveness, including the adverse event profile when used for diagnosis, treatment or prevention of the serious or life-threatening disease or condition, as well as data and other information on safety, effectiveness, risks and benefits, and to the extent available, alternatives. The risk-benefit analysis should synthesize data and information and include measures taken to mitigate risk or optimize benefit, limitations, uncertainty and data gaps, and a description of circumstances, if any, under which the product should not be used. 
But let's talk about the current EUA for COVID. So it was February, February the 4th that the Secretary of Health and Human Services determined that there was a public health emergency and it justified the authorization of an EUA. There was a great need for diagnostic test availability in the US as there is everywhere. The initial FDA was the authorization of the CDC through the EUA. As many of us know, there were problems with this test not long after, and it shows the frailty and the risks of any rapid response. But again, the agency was able to show that it could quickly adapt to the circumstances as needed. The FDA quickly changed policies that then allowed not only for an EUA, but for laboratories that are CLEAR certified to perform high complexity assays to produce laboratory developed molecular tests on the proviso that the laboratory submits an application for an EUA to the FDA within 15 days after validating the assay. This is another type of risk-based decision, but one that demonstrates the importance of having testing performed under quality systems with assay validation as a central theme. Not long later, the FDA also provided further policy changes, allowing market access prior to EUA submission to commercial manufacturers seeking to develop and distribute diagnostic molecular tests to detect the SARS virus uh, to clinical, that are being supplied to clinical laboratories or to healthcare workers for point of care testing. This policy does not apply to home testing. To support all this, the FDA quickly provided high level guidance on its website that keeps abreast of the evolving science. And this assists manufacturers in developing assays of value to the pandemic. And this is an example of the type of information that the FDA is continually updating. On this slide, we see the general description of submission requirements for an FDA EUA for COVID. The requirements include the proven demonstration of a product's utility in the emergency situation. And the end user is clearly considered as a pivotal stakeholder in these requirements. The FDA also has available in the form of reporting templates for molecular assays. Uh, template, these templates provide requirements for performance evaluation, including the types of study designs expected and are specifically provided for COVID-19. With specific validation recommendations being produced for serology tests, we saw that the FDA once again quickly used its discretionary powers to allow access to more testing, and this time for serology tests. The FDA in doing so decided not to object to the distribution and use of serology tests where the test has been validated, notification is provided to the FDA, and warning statements are included with the test. For example, noting the test has not been reviewed by the FDA and results from antibody testing should not be used as the sole basis to diagnose or exclude infection or to inform infection status. And here we see an approach that provides access in time of great urgency while highlighting the inherent risks in using a test with no pre-market assessment. So as of two days ago, there were 49 EUAs issued. This is a remarkable turnaround time. It's showing that the FDA is prioritizing every application. And even though there are other pathways, the notification pathways uh, that can be used, an EUA does provide uh, users with the assurance that the manufacturer's clinical evidence has been assessed. Also on the FDA website, we learn about the number of uh, lab developed tests that have been uh, made in the US. And as of uh, two days ago, 21 had been notified to the FDA. Now I would like to talk to you about what WHO is doing. WHO is not a regulator, but it provides scientific advice for countries lacking in regulatory capacity with regards to testing. The WHO Emergency Use Listing, or EUL, 
is coordinated by the department responsible for pre-qualification. In late February, WHO invited manufacturers interested in supplying to WHO member states to participate in the EUL, which provides an independent assessment to these jurisdictions of an assay's claim performance. And a little bit of a history about the EUL for WHO. It was created in response to the Ebola epidemic in 2014. Uh, the EUL, like in the US, is applicable not only to IVDs, but also to other health products. Uh, the procedure to a process or, or uh, an EUL is based on a regulatory type assessment. Uh, the information generated from the EUL is intended to assist interested procurement agencies and the member states on the suitability for use of the specific IVD based on a minimum set of available quality, safety and performance data. It's a time-limited response and any listing also comes with post-market commitments. WHO has published uh, specific requirements for molecular tests and for serology tests for COVID. And these again, like the FDA, uh, discuss the study type that should be considered. As of two days ago, four products had been listed under the EUL. Uh, this, of course, is much lower number than we've seen for the US FDA, but it's probably this probably takes into account two factors. And that is that the WHO, not being a regulator, does not have enforcement powers to act when a product is performing suboptimally. It can only make recommendations. So it's, not, it's going to make sure that any recommendation it gives is based on a really thorough assessment of significant uh, amount of data. And secondly, the WHO does not know in what setting the IVD will be used, therefore has a duty of care to ensure that it can be used according to the manufacturer's instruction in multiple settings with various levels of expertise. And so more data from the manufacturer is required to do this. Also, it means a greater dive into the manufacturer's evidence by the WHO in their assessment. Now let's to turn to Europe. Devices placed on the market in the EU must comply with the relevant requirements of the regulations at the moment, the regulation that exists is the Directive 9879-EC. But many of you may be aware that we're in the middle of transitioning in Europe to a new regulation. And uh, this is, we're in the transition period at the moment. And ultimately, manufacturers are responsible for bringing the corresponding devices in full conformity with either the IVDD, the Directive, or the IVDR, the regulation. Under the IVDD, the majority of, of IVDs for COVID will be self-certified, where the manufacturer ensures and declares conformity with the applicable requirements. The directive contains essential requirements that the device must satisfy, also requirements for quality systems that they are manufactured under, as well as certain requirements on the technical documentation that must be prepared and held by the manufacturer. Devices, though, intended for self-testing for COVID will require the involvement of a notified body, which must carry out additional verification on the technical documentation before the CE mark can be assigned. The directive prescribes that on duly justified request, a member state may, in the interest of protection of health, authorise the placing of the market within its territory of individual devices for which the conformity assessment procedures haven't yet been carried out. This may be pending the completion of the device's evaluation. The public health crisis associated with COVID-19 outbreak is considered justified circumstance for that purpose. A derogation such as this is to be temporary and the period of validity limited to what is strictly required for rendering the device compliant with the legislation, legislation or if earlier, when suitable substitutes can be expected or the critical needs will no longer be present. 
Such decisions require the careful consideration of risk against the benefit of having the device available for immediate use. The national processes for adapting these derogations may vary across member states. Now it's important to note that in-house tests are currently exempt from the directive. These are lab developed tests, although their development and use is generally controlled by national legislation. Just going back to that previous slide, it's important to remember also that abuse of any derogation measure may result in legal measures against the manufacturer or the distributor. So, in most cases, there is an obligation for a manufacturer who makes devices available on the market to inform the competent authorities. So, even if conformity assessment procedures have not been finished, the uh, competent authority of the member state in which the manufacturer or their authorised representatives is registered must be notified. It's important to note at this point that no self-tests have been approved for use in the EU or notified to their member state. The EU is issuing guidance to assist member states, policy makers and manufacturers and this is an example of one such guidance that is available. Of importance is this recent report that proposes performance criteria needed when designing different COVID assays. Different tests with different intended uses can play a role at the various stages of the pandemic. This guidance describes some of the performance criteria that would be expected for the various assays to benefit during this crisis. As of two days ago, uh, I was able to identify 350 IVDs that had been CE marked. So now let's turn to the last jurisdiction that I will discuss, and that's Australia. And the regulator there is the Therapeutic Goods Administration, or TGA. An ex emergency exemption was originally made on the 31st of July, which limited supply of COVID tests that were all not, not already included on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods to laboratories in the public health network. So that meant they didn't have to have the normal processes of uh, applying to the TGA. They could be directly provided to a lab within the public health network. But since that time, there was a significant increase in the need to test suspected cases. Therefore, near the end of March, and a new emergency exemption was created, which increased, test increased testing needs by expanding the former emergency exemption to both public and private laboratories in Australia that are appropriately accredited pathology laboratories. Now, an accredited pathology laboratory is defined in Australian law. So it doesn't mean it can go to any laboratory in Australia. So the, uh, this exemption allows COVID-19 tests to be immediately supplied to accredited pathology laboratories approved under the Health Insurance Act 1973, while the TGA continues to expedite the regulatory assessment process for these devices. So let's talk a little bit about the TGA expedited review process. The expedited assessment process is based on the information and performance data currently available at the time of application for inclusion on the ARTG. All COVID-19 tests that are included on the ARTG based on this expedited assessment process are subject to additional non-standard conditions, which, which makes it easier for the TGA to perform additional post-market assessments as experience and knowledge around COVID-19 diagnostic testing grows. The conditions require that additional evidence to support the ongoing safety and performance of the devices must be provided to the TGA within 12 months of approval. In Australia, the supply of self-tests is prohibited. However, point of care tests are certainly allowed. TGA is imposing conditions of supply though on uh, COVID tests for use at point of care. And here you can see the list of uh, conditions that are additional for point of care tests. As of two days ago, 34 assays had been included on the ARTG. 
So thank you very much. I would like to now hand over to my colleague, uh, Maggie, who will take you through uh, what is happening in Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi. I will continue to talk about EU application in Asia countries, including the process from Center of Medical Device Evaluation in China, the process in Food and Drug Administration in Taiwan, and the process in Health Science Organization in Singapore. And last one will be the process in South Korea, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety. We know China is the first country to incur COVID-19 outbreak back to December 2019. Therefore, China's Center for Medical Device Evaluation published two guidance. The first one is for the nuclear acid IVD testing for COVID-19, the RT-PCR testing. The second one is the rapid screening testing for COVID-19 is the antibody antigen uh, testing for COVID-19. According to all these guidance, the COVID-19 testing IVD has been classified as a class 3 medical device in China. Center for Medical Device Evaluation, they have committed luck. They will complete the technical review within 10 days from the day they receive the application. They also committed luck. All the administrative review will be complete within three days after they, they complete the technical review. Therefore, less than two weeks, the manufacturer should receive the conclusion from Center for Medical Device Evaluation. Until end of March, they have approved 23 COVID-19 IVDs in China. From the table here, you can see 15 of them are RT-PCR, the nuclear acid testing. Another five is antibody antigen testing. Seven was approved back to January. Another seven is February. This is time when there is a large outbreak in China. Another nine was approved in March. Half of them are antibody antigen kit. So what should be included in the EUS package? The document preparation actually is very similar to US EUA package, except for several items. First, the language wise, all the documents need to be provided in Chinese, including the application form, including the analytical validation report, the clinical performance report. The reality reports always need to be written in Chinese. And then the batch record is another difference. At least you need to provide three batch records, including all the QHC reports. One of the difference from other countries, I would say, is the uh, item 13 product registration report. China has been asking the manufacturer Manufacturer need to send the IDD to the party for validation. At least three batch of the IDD need to be validated by a third party. Another thing is if your kit has been used by another equipment, you also need to provide the information of the equipment, including all the approval documents. The second country we will discuss is the Taiwan. In Taiwan, we know Taiwan confirmed the first COVID-19 test back to January early this year. And there is never a large infected population in Taiwan. Therefore, government has been using their own developed nuclear acid IBD for the testing. However, the the biotech industry, they have been developing different IVD for COVID-19. Therefore, TSDA also working with the industry on 24th of March. 
they complete two reference documents to guidance. One is for nucleic acid testing, the other one is a rapid screening for antibody antigen testing. In Taiwan, we call it as a special test manufacturing instead of EUA. Two days later, after they complete these two guidance, TFDA Taiwan Food and Drug Administration, they set up a consulting lab, a whole lab for industry to call up to consult any questions regarding to all these application procedure and document preparation. On 7th of April, they released a document to TFDA website for the nuclear acid IVD application. According to this document, COVID-19 IVD also belong to class 3 medical device. What is the difference between the regular marketing approval and the SDN, the special test manufacturing? The legal basis is different. The legal basis for the marketing approval is under Article 40 of Pharmaceutical Affairs Act. However, for special test manufacturing, it's under two articles. One is Article 48, the other one is Article 4 from the regulation of approval manufacturing and import for specified drugs. The reason to have a second one because most of our, our available approved kits in Taiwan so far they are imported from abroad. The second difference will be required documentation. The, 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 last, the biggest difference will be the chemical evaluation report and the manufacturing session. For the marketing approval, you need to have a well-controlled clinical performance study. However, for the special test manufacturing, you only have a limit uh, a sample size. Under the certain situation, you also can provide the protocol first, and then you, you validate your kit with the clinical sample after the, the special test manufacturing is approved. The other thing is the manufacturing. All of the kits under marketing approval need to be produced, manufactured under a GMT facility. And for the SCM, you, you can produce them in a GMT compliant facility, but it doesn't need to be GMT facility. Up to that, TFDA has approved 9 COVID-19 nuclear acid testing in Taiwan. And as I say earlier, uh, one, the first one, Gene Rich, is the only one developed um, by a biotech company in Taiwan. The other eight of them, they are actually imported from different countries. There is more restriction in Taiwan regarding to developing COVID-19 IBD. We only have a limit sample. And then also, as you can see here, all the COVID-19 testing only can perform in the restriction, restrict laboratories. And so far in Taiwan, we only allow all the testing to be performed under a P3 laboratory. TSDA is also trying to expedite the approval procedure for the industry, so they have assessed some of the studies, including step to step reproducibility, residue and cross contamination, sample storage and delivery, and software validation. All these can be exempted, don't need to submit under SDM. As for clinical performance for a comparison study, the nuclear acid COVID-19 IVD, you only need to provide at least 30 negative and 30 positive samples. However, after SDN is granted, you need to have another file each sample to validate your kit. For the rapid screening COVID-19 IVD, because there is only limit sample available in Taiwan, if you allow them to submit the protocol first to discuss how they're going to validate the RVD. 
After the FDA is granted, another 50 negative and 5 positive samples need to be um, submitted to validate the chip. Send us other EUA application. After you receive the approval, the package uh, labeling has to have the wording. This case only approved by the special test manufacturing under academic prevention. Another thing for um, the difference is the manufacturing and quality data for SDA. PSDA has uh, recommended the document need to submit for the manufacturing and quality control, including specifications, the quality controls for all the materials, and the flowchart of your product manufacturing, your package insert, the labeling your shipping procedure. If the factory material is available, for example, the factory layout, the QHC document, all these also can be submitted together. However, for SD, and as I mentioned, this product doesn't need to manufacture it at the GMP facility, but the manufacturing process should compile with GMP. What should be including in the, in the application package? It's similar to China, USA, and European country. The good thing is, Except for the application form, this one needs to be written in Chinese. Other documents can be written in English. So let's say you submit a UA to USFDA. You can use the same package submit to TFDA. In principle, TFDA, the promise the review cycle should be complete within a month. This including the information required, the feedback, the external uh, review from different Institute. Next, what we talk about is Singapore. In Singapore, for the emerging, um, the emerging use, they call provisional authorization. How kind authorization that has this provisional authorization as a risk based review? From time to time, you have to submit the safety and performance of this testing after you receive the provisional authorization to ensure the safety and performance is valid. However, the health science authorization is that observe any issue for the safety and or performance, they can withdraw this approval at any time. Any COVID-19 receive the provisional authorization can supply the kit to any health care institute in Singapore, including hospital, clinic, or any laboratories in Singapore. How to submit the provisional authorization in Singapore? It's really straightforward. You have to prepare all these documents and then send them by email. The document including the description of the kit, the analytical validation, and then you have to have almost all the uh, elements you submit for other emergency use, emergency use. The only thing is quite different is the summary of any plan or ongoing validation, including clinical studies. This is how they, they would like you to submit the safety and promotion report from time to time. Health plans operation that have come in, they will get in touch with the manufacturer within three working days from the time you submit your uh, application by email. However, they don't have the time for the uh, review cycle. So far, they have approved 24 IDDs in Singapore, including 19 for nucleic acid test kit, and then another five for the antibody rapid screen kit. And most of them are approved in March and April when there's a huge outbreak in Singapore.
the last country we will discuss is South Korea. And this is a uh, very important critical because we, we do see in South Korea uh back to February there was a huge outbreak and then they immediately has all the actions to provide a large population screening, even they have something called uh drug screening and that's how they control the the infection in South Korea. In South Korea, the emergency use for approval process is only requested by the government. If there is a concern about the epidemic infection of infectious diseases, and the government notice there is not enough approved product in South Korea, or they will be an issue for supply chain. The Ministry of Food and Drug Safety they work together with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to promote evaluation and request emergency use lessons for COVID-19 IVDs. There are four step approval process for the COVID-19 IVDs. As you can see the flow chart down here, when there is the uh, outbreak, the Center for the East Control and Prevention. There was then an emergency use notice IVD data request to a manufacturer who has a potential IVD kit and who has a production facility. Then the manufacturer will send an emergency use application to the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety for review. This document will be reviewed under the uh, Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, also under the Center for uh, Disease Control and Prevention, together with uh, the experts from Korean Society of Laboratory Medicine. After the NSDS, they grant approval, and the Center for Disease control and prevention will notify the manufacturer. After that, there are five RT-PCR uh, testing approved in, in South Korea. And you can see uh, several testing uh, have a large production which can provide the kit to other countries in Europe and USA. So what should be including in, in the submission package for emergency use request in South Korea? Um, again, it's similar to other countries. Always the, the, print, the, the basic document needs to be including, including all the device description, the uh, analytical validation report, the stability report, and also, you need to have a packaging in the labeling. The only thing is different here. Um, in Korea, you need to provide the maximum production capacity per day for them to evaluate how many you can provide for the facility for the, the, the daily use. Also, they, they are asking for this practical comparison. Um, uh, for at least in other countries, they, they, you don't have to pre uh, prepare this part. You only do it uh, with the with the uh, clinical comparison study. The Ministry of Food and Drug Safety they have been working closely with the industry as well. They want to make sure all the documents they are can be used for application. They also want to make sure all the manufacturer, the industry people, they familiar with. Uh, the whole procedure. Therefore, when they have any information required, um, they can have a few that uh, as fast as they can. The product labeling has approved and submitted with the market approval period before emergency use. 
We ask the ask you of approve IDD monthly level with emergency use sent us out of country during the time for emergency use. Therefore, we can see all the country, no matter in US, Europe, Asia, uh, Australia, we have been working, uh, the agency working hard and closely with the industry to develop as many uh, COVID-19 IVD testing kits for the population screening as possible as they can. And we do see the effort has been uh, developed uh, more than more kids than, uh, than before, and part of them they have been used in, in, in the market in a different hospital institute, in a hospital, in a clinic. Thank you. This is my talk for today. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We will post the webinar playback to our YouTube page, and we will send you a link so you can rewatch the video. Thank you, and have a nice day.